get more to the story. Now, our next presenter is going to be Dennis uh, Venema. He got his PhD in biology at the University of British Columbia and is now a professor uh, at Trinity Western University, a Christian university that is, the, is in the Vancouver area. And I've asked him this afternoon, actually Lauren was the one that uh, helped to invite him to come, to explore what is becoming an increasingly, I think, interesting and, and, and very important question about uh, this whole uh, issue of what do we learn from the Human Genome Project? What does it imply about uh, uh, human evolution and or uh, historical Adam and Eve, and uh, I think he's going to be sharing things that are somewhat in the same uh, area as what Francis Collins did in his book, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Thank you for coming. We're glad you're here. It's a privilege to be here, and I'd like to thank uh, Lauren and uh, Walter for the invitation. My purpose here today is fairly narrowly defined. I will speak as Walter has mentioned, on genomics evidence for two issues, for common descent with humans, between humans and chimpanzees, that these organisms share a common ancestor. And the second line of evidence that we will explore is to look at what genomics evidence can tell us about ancestral population sizes at various times of human evolution. And then I'll make some very brief comments on the theological implications, but we have three theologians speaking afterwards, so I feel somewhat free from that constraint. This opening slide is just here to remind me that evolutionists are not as scary as they might appear to be to some, and also that there are many lines of evidence that support evolutionary biology. You can see our uh, evolutionist. I would have preferred if the cartoon had said Darwinist, but such as it is, it says evolutionist. We have the skull being held out, we have the DNA strand being held out, and you'll notice throughout the talk um, I will be focusing only on the, the genomics evidence. However, this other line, there are other lines of evidence, but I am narrowing my focus to one. Okay, so here's just a brief sketch of an outline of what I'm going to talk about. Start off with evidence for human chimpanzee common ancestry. Then we'll move on for, to evidence for ancestral hominid population sizes using different methods, and then some very brief thoughts on biblical scientific concordism. Okay, so in terms of evidence for human chimpanzee common ancestry, I'm going to look at four lines of evidence and then discuss what I believe is the most parsimonious explanation of these lines of evidence. The lines of evidence are homology, redundancy, syntony, pseudogeny, and then the most parsimonious explanation, in my opinion. So, beginning with homology, which is probably the most familiar topic to everyone at a, at a lay level. This is an argument that's proffered very often from a theistic evolutionist side, in terms of similarities between living organisms. This is an alignment of one protein that I work on. This is something that you're probably familiar with at some level. This is the amino acid sequence of insulin from various species. And at the very top, we have human, chimp just below, and then a number of other species. This is just the sort of thing you can pull up using BLAST at a very uh, quick and easy way to do. And what we notice between humans and chimpanzees specifically, you won't be able to see it because you're too far away, and even though we have the biggest room, we have the smallest screen, is that of the 110 amino acids that are present in human insulin and the 110 in chimpanzee insulin, there are only two differences at the amino acid level and they're right there. You won't be able to see them. Now, I won't spend too much time on this argument because it's the one that's the most well-known to you. A very common response from an anti-evolutionary or an anti-common descent position is to say, well, function obviously constrains amino acid sequence, so what we're seeing here is an instance of common design, not necessarily indicative of common descent. I'll move quickly on to the next line of evidence, which I think quite thoroughly refutes that idea that we're looking at common design as opposed to common descent. Now, I'm fully aware that various forms of intelligent design do not deny common ancestry, but I've been asked to speak about the evidence of common descent, so that's where I'm focusing my, my talk. So what do we mean by redundancy? Well, if you remember from your high school biology or first-year level biology for those that have taken such, uh, the amino acid code, the codon code, 
there are, because it's a triplet code, there are 64 different possibilities. However, proteins in living systems are comprised of 20 amino acids, so there are different available codons available to code for various different amino acids. So while we see constraints, say perhaps to follow that argument for a while, we see amino acid constraint in terms of function perhaps, we can ask the question, what's the underlying genetic code that's producing this sequence of amino acids? Does it match up with what we would predict from common ancestry as opposed to common design? Or to put it on another way, are there various design options for this specific amino acid code? Could it be coded in different ways? And the answer is yes, very much so. So we're going to have a quick look at this little tiny bit at the very beginning, highlighted by the box, and have a look at the underlying genetic sequence that encodes for those amino acids. So here's what we see in humans on the top line and chimpanzees on the next line. You'll notice I've included one of the amino acids that's different. What we see here in this small snippet, we see of the 42 nucleotides present, that 41 of them are identical. And the one change in the one codon that's different, it's a single nucleotide change between the codons. Now, a little thought experiment that occurred to me was, if I was going to try to design this sequence in a way that would be the most different in terms of sequence, how far could I drive it in terms of identity? And the, the answer is by using the various different codons that are available for these different amino acids, one can actually drive the identity in terms of uh, sequence homology between these two snippets down into the lower 50s range. So from a purely design-oriented perspective, it would be possible to code this sequence using this exact amino acid sequence using a nucleotide code that is almost 50% different. Yet what we see, of course, when we look at the sequence, and here's just highlighting the, uh, the yellow highlighting the nucleotides that are constrained. You cannot change those ones and have those amino acids in that sequence, but all the other ones are up for grabs, and there are numerous different options for many of these different codons. So if you do a little back-of-the-envelope kind of math, and part of the fun here is that small probabilities, I mean, you can't really do a talk of this nature without, you know, talking about small probabilities, right? It's just a natural part of these types of events. There are a, a little over 26 million different ways to code this sequence with different codons to achieve the same amino acid sequence. Yet what we see is the one that is the most consistent with the hypothesis of common descent between those 26 million different options. If one takes that logic and extends it a little further, remember there are 110 amino acids in insulin. If you take that logic a little further, here's just a little bit more of the protein, just continuing that logic. The numbers underneath each codon simply indicate the number of possible codons that are available for that particular amino acid. And very soon you can understand in terms of combinatorial statistics that this, the number of possible options becomes absolutely huge. So just for this sequence of 40 amino acids, we now see that we're up to approximately somewhere in the order of 10 to the 1.8 times 10 to the 19 or 10 to the 18, 18 times 10 to the 18 different options for this sequence. Yet what we see again is something that is extremely close and we see something that is very consistent with only single nucleotide changes inherited and divergence from a common ancestor. Again, it doesn't prove anything, but it's suggestive, I think. Now, oh, this is just to make the point that we're looking at just one tiny, tiny little bit of sequence here. And the comparison between the human genome and the chimpanzee genome, now that we have reasonably complete sequences for both of those organisms, the point to make here is that we have a sample size of 2,700 megabases, or 2.7 billion nucleotides. And what we see when we align those sequences one to another is we see a 1.23% difference between those sequences. So we're not talking about just a small region of the genome that seems constrained in this manner. We're talking about vast, vast stretches of the genome. And another point to make is that if we take, if we look specifically at samples from gene exons, which comprise quite a small proportion of the genome, you can see that the numbers are even stronger. We see an even uh, lower difference. We see only approximately.